Hello, my name is Javon Jones. Welcome to the Private Money Podcast. Today we have a special guest, Tony Chin. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. Great to be here, man. I want to get right into it, man. Can you tell us about where you're from and what your upbringing was like? Yeah, so I'm uh, born and raised on the East Coast, um, place little little place called Blacksburg, Virginia, um, home of Virginia Tech, where my dad was a professor. So grew up there, great place to grow up. Uh, ended up in North, upstate New York for college, um, and then uh, spent some time in New Jersey after college, and then moved out here to Chicago, where I've been ever since uh, for business school. Uh, met my wife on a blind date, and uh, as they <laughs> say, the rest is history. So I've been here ever since. Sounds good, man. So you know, as I see you study chemical engineering in, in in college, you know what was that like? As well as you know, what kind of brought you back to business school to get your MBA? Yeah, you know, I, as a college student, I really didn't know what I, what I didn't know in a way. Um, I knew I I loved solving problems and like analyzing things. I liked math and science, so like chemical engineering was like a good um, trifecta of like bringing all that stuff together. Um, coming out of uh, undergrad, I worked at a pharmaceutical company for four years, and really that's where I caught the business bug. You know, I was working for a Fortune ten you know, pharmaceutical company, and we were negotiating, you know, construction contracts. And I just, I remember realizing like, okay, I don't, I'm like this 23 year old guy negotiating these multi-million dollar contracts. But because I had, you know, Merck on the name of my business card, I was negotiating these contracts. And um, so that, and I just saw the power of business, not just to make money, but really it's both to make money and to do good in the, in the world. So just really saw business as a scalable way to influence society, create jobs, and, and do some good in the world. I get you. I get you. So when did you realize that you wanted to become a founder? And how did Hospital Impact as well as Savvy Daddy come about? Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, I I probably always had the entrepreneurial spirit in me. Even in college, I started up like a student club around music and social impact. So I think I've always had it. Um, it was, you know, my dad was, even though he was a professor, he basically took summers and just was always starting something new or doing some new consulting or different kind of things. So I think I just had that growing up. So, you know, Hospital Impact started, that's the first company I started and I was in the hospital management industry and just realized that just felt like everything that was out there around hospital management was kind of old and stodgy. Um, and I thought, you know, why don't we bring a, an interesting voice into this? And that was also, this is back, you know, almost 15 years when, you know, basically hospital impact was launched as a blog. And this was back when people were still asking me, what is a blog? <laughs> um, <laughs> But it was just like, I saw this hole in the industry where like, there's so much interesting things where you can learn from other industries. Like we did this whole series about a book that came out around that time around what, what could your hospital learn from Disney? Mm -hmm. um, so just different topics like that. And then curating what other people were talking about and putting it in a, in a central place. So that really became what Hospital Impact was. And then, you know, ended up selling that to a publisher so it was really out of my own experience, seeing, kind of seeing a whole of something that's not being covered, like maybe a little bit about what you're doing on this podcast as well, and then adding a unique voice to it. Savvy Daddy was the same. I became a dad in 06. I went online looking for advice for new dads, and everything I found was <laughs> advice for women. It was like postpartum depression, breastfeeding. I'm not going to be able to help out with that very well. So realized that a lot of dads just don't get a lot of support. So started Savvy Daddy as a so social network for dads. And we ended up being about like 10,000 dads talking about all kinds of things from, you know, and actually the, the most popular topic ever was what order of the Star Wars movie should you show your kids? Like, the, <laughs> I mean, it's like silly stuff like that to point, you know, to a lot of single dad stuff. Um, so it was just a great, uh, kind of a social network before Facebook happened. Um, mm -hmm. which, and, and eventually Facebook sort of took us out because all that conversation migrated over. 
Um, so it was actually that's I mean that's a little bit of a, a point of timing of like sometimes you might have the right idea at the wrong time, and I was probably a little bit early or maybe a little late in some ways, and so wasn't able to monetize that one. So I ended up selling that one for sort of spare parts, but uh, lesson learned, you know, being a founder. Yeah, how would you say your founder experiences impact your investment investments that you make? Yeah, I think all of our experiences from age zero on up impact our investments. Like we're all, we're all of us are on this journey, learning lessons, sometimes the hard way, sometimes through our own failures, hopefully, you know, as much as we can through the failures and successes of others. Um, I think in my own journey, entrepreneurial journey, I just, one of the things that I realized is that um, it's hard being a, a startup. It's hard being an entrepreneur very rarely does one entrepreneur have all the quote unquote superpowers to get something going. Like it's, it's okay in the beginning, but it's like, usually you've got someone who's more outwardly facing someone more sales oriented who can, who's the talker and kind of close deals. And then usually there's always someone else that's more detailed oriented organizers and puts things together. And when you have that kind of combo, or sometimes it's like a technical person and a business person, that was kind of some of my experience. So, so just realizing the importance of you know, having a good team from the get-go. Sometimes it's just yourself and you got to cover all the bases, but very quickly you can start bringing people in to help you where you're weak. So that it takes a lot of self-awareness, just knowing where you're good and where you're not so good. Man, I, I agree. I guess one of the things I would ask you is, is there anything that you know now that you wish you've known, uh, that you wish you would have known earlier? as well as I want to kind of get into what made you move out to Naomi. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, that is, a. Uh, I'm actually just finishing up a post on that. And I was sort of like, you know, I've now that I've invested in 25 companies, I've just been thinking about what are, what are some lessons that I've learned from, from my own entrepreneur experiences, as well as investing in 25 companies. And they're just, so, so many things. Um, I mean, everything from, uh, I think a lot of things in life and in entrepreneurship are mastering what I call the both and tension. Mm -hmm. You sort of have to be two things at once. Um, so it's like having, you know, Jim Collins talks a lot about in his, like the best leaders in the world who have performed the best over the last hundred years they have this weird mix of extreme humility and crazy ambition. So it's like, how do you, how do you not get ahead of yourself in terms of like being too overly confident or cocky and having humility, knowing you've got your limits, but then also having this like fire and intensity and ambition. Um, so it's really hard to do sort of both of those things or, or it's, it's being able to discern I'm an early stage entrepreneur. I'm, I'm facing this obstacle. Is it an obstacle or is it actually, is this my signal to say it's time to stop? Mm. Um, but like this both in, like sometimes you got to persevere. Sometimes you got to pivot and knowing the difference is almost the whole game. So that's a couple things that come to mind. And then, so you're asking me a little bit about Nairobi about 10 years ago, my wife and I, we were just having, actually a breakfast with her sister who's telling us about a friend who had spent a year in, in Kenya. And I don't know what it was about that conversation. I remember listening to the story and my heart's like pounding out of my chest. I'm sweating. My wife's, you know, can't fidgeting in her chair. I mean, we sort of call it our God moment, but it's like, I, I just remember listening to the story. I'm just thinking we're supposed to be in Nairobi. Um, and it took us six months to decide, are we crazy? Like we've got two young kids. We're going to move to Africa. Never even thought of it. Um, but yeah, over time, we're just like, the more we thought about it, the more we felt convicted that this was the place for us to be. So it took us like a year to sort of unwind our lives here in Chicago and then make the move out to this little town in Kenya, um, called Kajabi, which is, uh, about an hour North of Nairobi. Kenya, which is in Eastern Africa. And it was just like the most amazing experience of our life, probably. And, and I'd, I'd say for, for our kids' lives as well. 
Mm. Man, how how for someone that's never been to Nairobi or Kajabi, how would you describe these cities in this place? Yeah, it's I mean it's probably not what you think. <laughs> so <laughs> let me give you a little bit of taste of of Nairobi. And Nairobi is a super cosmo cosmopolitan city. Like Nairobi is a global city with, you know, let's say the larger area has 4 million people. You have all the multinational companies there that have headquarters like Coke and Pfizer and PwC and Google and Toyota, uh, Facebook, and, you know, all that big texts are out there. They're all, they're all hiring techies out there. You've got like the UN and the World Bank and all those folks. So it's, it's a really interesting mix of international people um, really smart techies. Um, some people call Nairobi the Silicon Savannah, sort of kind of like Silicon Valley in a different way because so much techie things happen. Um, there's Microsoft just put down a development center there. Um, JP Morgan Chase just decided we got to open a branch there. So it's like, who's not investing in Nairobi is, is more the question now than who is. Um, it's a, and it's, Maybe not as, uh, I mean, depends on kind of where you're coming from, but like where I lived, it was like tropical. We're, you know, so much, it's not like desert yet. You, you kind of hit the, the desert further up. Um, all kinds of climates going on in Kenya. We're in this tropical climate. So beautiful weather all year round, except for like the rainy seasons. So you're talking about 50s, 60s, 70s, plenty of places to hike, obviously go see the safaris but super diversified economy. Um, I, so I would go down to like the local veggie ladies and uh, buy my three avocados for 90 cents. Oh, wow. And I would whip out my phone and pay them through my phone. So like talk about leapfrogging opportunities. Um, Kenya is one of the world leaders in mobile money. Um, so for every dollar that gets transacted through phones in the world, 70 cents of that's happening in Africa. So there's some really interesting, like if you have a mobile phone, now you have a bank account kind of opportunities and FinTech and like a lot of really interesting leapfrog things going on um, in Africa and in Kenya, especially. So I'm wondering, like during your time in Kenya, is this when Kenyungu? Yeah, Kenyungu, yeah, you did Kenyungu. it. Is this when Kenyungu Ventures uh, comes about? Is this when you create Kenyungu Ventures? Yeah, so what happened was like I was running my software business stateside. We brought on a real CEO founder who came into the business um, and so replaced me. You know, I, I sort of I realized over the years I don't actually love being CEO. This guy's knocked, knocked it out of the park and he's, he's really scaled the business in crazy ways. So I graduated to the board per se and I was in Kenya with a lot of time in my hands. And as a guy that loves hanging out with entrepreneurs, I just started having coffee with entrepreneurs in Nairobi and they kept introducing me to their friends. And I, so I think 700 coffees later, <laughs> um, I was blown away by the talent I was meeting. Um, global entrepreneurial caliber talent in Nairobi. Um, and I, I was joking with some of my friends. I'm like, I think I would pick these guys over some of the, you know, the the, the Silicon Valley CEOs that are out there. Um, a, they would out execute them. B, they're just hungrier. And C, their core motivation for starting these businesses really is around um, solving a problem. So this intersection of amazing talent with huge problems to solve that might impact a billion people. That intersection, and in a way, I feel like there's not that many places in the world like Nairobi. So that's when I started angel investing. Um, ended up making like 25 angel investments. I just believed in these entrepreneurs and what they're building and the problems they're trying to solve. And as part of that, that's kind of where Kenyungu Ventures started. I, I took some of the FinTech uh, investments that I made and did it through can you ventures um so sort of as like a holding company of of some of my personal investments okay and, and that some of those companies ended up being the ones that now have really started to scale and so i so a couple of years ago 
I joined a firm called Vernon Frontiers um, as a partner. And uh, they had always been wanted to invest in tech in Africa. Um, they've already been operating in Africa for 10 years with agriculture and real estate. So now it's like tech is the third arm. And so as me joining, we uh, I brought Kanyungu Ventures with me essentially to Vernon Frontiers. And now we've, you know, we're, we're launching a fintech fund for Africa. Okay. And how do you balance the desire for high returns as well as the impact that you're making in these communities? Yeah, there is. It's a very tri tricky topic. I think what we're trying to do at Vernon Frontiers is we want to do both. We want to do, speaking of both and, right? We're, we believe the best investments in Africa both create a compelling return for investors and create some amazing social impact, job creation, local wealth creation on the ground. Um, that's really what we're, we're about. So, um, you know, so Vernon Frontiers, we've been around for 10 years. We've built like a $180 million portfolio. In our next 10 years, we're really shooting to build a $2 billion portfolio and create 100,000 jobs on the ground. So it's, in a way, they go hand in hand. Um, and I think, you know, if we're going to do it right, we also, there is a line to cross. I think there's some, sometimes there is a decision around we could make more or we could do more impact. Sometimes it's like that. It, they're not, it's not always hand in hand. So in, in a lot of those cases, we have to err on the side of impact. But we really believe that Africa is actually an investment destination. People have kind of, people have been thinking about the risks of Africa in an, in an outdated misperceived way. So I think you can actually get decent returns in Africa if you are in the right niches and have the right teams on the ground. Speaking of, of niches, I'm wondering what is it about FinTech specifically that kind of uh, interests you in Africa? Yeah, I, so FinTech is really fun for me for a couple of reasons. One is that it's, I think it's one of the most scalable opportunities on the continent. Um, if you think about maybe the 10 unicorns in Africa that have emerged over the last five years, most of them are fintechs. Um, you'll, you've seen over the last couple of years that pretty much everyone now is investing into fintech in Africa. So like the Andreessen's, the Sequoia's, um, you know, Fidelity, Goldman Sachs, MasterCard, Visa, you know, everyone's coming in to invest in fintech because they see the opportunity. Um, but maybe more importantly for me, I also just see that we're in the early innings of financial infrastructure in Africa. So I feel like the next for the next five to 10 years, we're really building kind of the foundation for the next hundred years for the African economy. So building sort of building the pipes underneath the, the house, if you will, like it's not super sexy per se, not everyone can even see it, but if you can run those pipes well and, um, then you're going to be, it's going to be a, it's not only will it be very lucrative, but you will have uh, generations of entrepreneurs building on top of those uh, foundations for, you know, the years to come. I'll give you a quick example. So, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs I meet in Africa, they're trying to solve like problem A, like something around healthcare or education. But what, once they get into it, what they realize is that, that they also have to solve problem B. And oftentimes problem B is a fintech problem. It's like being paid on time or getting access to credit or you know, having a place to park your cash in investments and whatnot. So what often happens, or actually the big one is like payments. Like how do you, how do you secure payments across borders, you know, reconciling all that? Um, those kinds of problems are the are the fintech problems that will be solved in the next five, 10 years, making it easier for all these entrepreneurs to solve their problem A, because problem B is being solved by a fintech. So I think it's a multiplier for entrepreneurship and, and a multiplier for you know, progress economically for all these countries in Africa. Man, thank you so much for sharing that. And this is just one of the questions that I have. And just in recent news, Apple is now uh, 
We, we it's like we're seeing the tech companies wanting to become banking companies and the yes. bank companies wanting to become tech companies. What are, what are your what is your take on 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 this whole new Apple uh, situation that that has emerged? Yeah, I mean, I think this is just part of a trend that has been going on for I would say for twenty five years, which is all tech companies are financial companies and all financial companies are tech companies actually so if you think about jp morgan chase spending 12 billion dollars last year on tech on apps on fintech solutions, <laughs> are they a bank or are they a fintech i mean <laughs> that's actually a legitimate question if you look at any car dealership in america and you look at their bottom line they're making a little bit of money on the cars but where they're really making money is the loans on those cars so are is a car dealership about cars or is it about financial services? Um, <laughs> if you think about airlines, right? Collecting all these points, that's kind of like a currency. That's like a separate currency and it's like an IOU. So it's, you know, they call it whatever they call it, but that's almost like a currency. It's almost even, even like gift cards, right? Gift cards are like a, a, finan a financing instrument that allows for them to get cash today for products they're going to deliver tomorrow. That we're basically lending these companies money for free. So, you know, I'm not surprised that Apple has, um, you know, come into this space with the Apple card. And I, I did see the announcement yesterday. So it's like the 4.15% or whatever on the savings account. And um, that's just part of, uh, that's just going to be part of the, Part of the bigger game, which is the, those that have the data and the, the, the those that have the sticky customers and the data about their sticky customers can easily offer them, you know, these kinds of financial services. Um, and then, you know, I can see it expanding even further from there. So you see all the folks that are trying to get into pay, like payments, um, you know, and the Apple Pay. That was, you know, not that long ago that now it's, now it's like become so common. So we're, we're going to see more of this convergence of every tech company is a financial services company and every financial services company is a tech company. Man, finally, as we, as we come to a close, what advice do you have for investors who, who are considering entering the African market? And also yeah. for anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, that's great. So I would say give Africa a real look. Um I would say Africa has been growing consistently for the last 25 years. So if you look at like Africa's GDP chart over the last 25 years, it pretty much is doubling every 10 years. So it's like a 7% ish, you know, CAGR for the last 25 years. I mean, that's crazy growth. Um, so with, if you look at the graph, the only little divot is like COVID, but it has since caught up. So I think Africa could be the next growth frontier in a world where there's not a lot of growth in other places. Africa is growing like crazy and that's going to continue. Um, secondly, I'd say Africa is less risky than you think. You, know, you see the news and whatnot. It's, you know, and, and unfortunately the news, it's, it feels so far away when you see this bad news about Africa or whatever. It's, it's sort of like you know, when my friends from Taiwan asked me whether Chicago is is safe because there's all this, <laughs> violence, right? It's sort of like, yeah. you know, it's pockets, right? There's definitely pockets. It's small pockets. On the whole, if you look at the last 25 years, political institutions have stabilized. Um, there's more rule of law. There's more trade. There's more infrastructure. So I just think for the next 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to see some amazing growth less risk than you think. And then finally, I just say Africa is, you know, with all the natural resources that it has, 60% of the arable land on the planet is in Africa. Like you could grow enough food in Africa to feed the whole world two times over. Um, and then you've got all these leapfrog opportunities. So I would just say, take a look at some interesting opportunities in Africa because um, it's worth taking a look. And you know, the, the final thing I'd say, too, is just the, a lot of folks are trying to come into Africa and extract and exploit. Um, you know, you'd really hope that people can come in, that investors can come into Africa with a, 
with a heart to to create and bless and and multiply and that's kind of our our mo and so that's kind of what we're hoping to do in africa it's like you know we've got these farms and it's and it's about co-creating these you know rural communities on these farms and it's, it's about creating these jobs it's about upskilling folks so that the next time they go out for a job they're that much more marketable um, and it's about local wealth creation so it's so it's the the split of the pie is more and more african as we go forward so um yeah i would just say give it a second look tony it was a pleasure to have you please let everybody know where they can find you on social media yeah you can look for us uh actually the website is live as of today so vernonfrontiersfintech.com <laughs> um that's the main place to look for us there or on linkedin Okay. There you have it. Uh, the private money podcast until next time. Thank you again.